Okay. All right, well, we are at the hour and I see folks that are coming in uh, right. to our webinar. So welcome today. We are talking everything toxic, uh, environmental toxins, root causes of sickness with Dr. Christian Gonzalez. Uh, Connie, next slide. Before we get started, I just wanted to go through a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so you are all in listen only mode. Uh, we will take question and answer after the session. So, but please use the Q&A box uh, that is below uh, for questions and answers. And this will be recorded and we will share the link after we're ready. If you are having any technical difficulties or have any questions after the webinar, please feel free to email us at info at aanmc.org. Uh, so with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Gonzalez, obtained his naturopathic doctoral degree at the University of Bridgeport, and uh, his work has spanned complementary medicine uh, with cancer. He subsequently went on to complete a residency at the Cancer Treatment Centers of America uh, and really started to become proficient in integrative oncology, as well as starting to turn to all of the obstacles uh, that are there uh, that play play an obstacle to restoring health. Um, and so he has a podcast uh, called Heal Thyself uh, with over a million and a half downloads, which is super wonderful. And uh, with that, uh, Dr. Gonzalez is going to be talking to us today. Uh, next slide, Connie. On, uh, on everything environmental and what you all can do to, uh, to keep yourselves healthy and keep your environments healthy. And with that, I'm going to make my face go away and mute. And so, Dr. Gonzalez, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, Joanne. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, really appreciate the time that you guys are spending here to really learn about something that's super important when it comes to overall medicine, overall health, overall healing. So as Joanne mentioned, um, this has become the environmental toxin part of my career has become, it's one of the last parts that, that sort of showed up in this journey. But but really for me, really for me, it's been, uh, it's been a matter of what things are we not talking about in health and healing. So when I started, I, I went to dental school and I thought I was going to be a dentist. I thought it would, uh, I really wanted to be an orthodontist. And then I had um, the experience of someone in my family, immediate family, get diagnosed with cancer and it was breast cancer. So at the time I was not fully aware of how that worked. I just thought you get radiation surgery and you're, you know, you're healed and you're done. And you don't have to go back. Um, then I started learning more how there's a huge gap in not only nutrition in cancer care, but really the environmental part. And I, I just started understanding it a little bit throughout school. Uh, we learn more and more. And then really when it came to a head was after school, when I started treating after my residency, I started treating cancer patients, and I started drawing a pie of all of the factors that participated in cancer, right? Because cancer is never just one disease. And this isn't just all about cancer, but it's really just understanding that, you know, this is an end stage, end stage um, manifestation of things going on in the body. And when it comes to environmental toxins, it's something that we don't, we don't talk about enough. And it's something that is very insidious something that can absolutely affect all of our healths. And the, the reason why it's not spoken about enough is because it just over time's happened in small amounts. It's not, we don't feel when we have environmental toxins in our body, right? So I think that uh, it's really important for us to know what they are, where they're found, and how do we, how do we reduce them as much as possible? So next slide, please. All right. So the, the question is, is, is your environment potentially getting you sick? Because there's a lot of us I know who are on this webinar who may have gotten sick at some point and the doctor said, hey, listen, this is really general. Uh, you know, we think it's this. Here are some medication and let's see if it gets better. So particularly in allergies, you know, you see a lot of children get really sick with skin or respiratory issues and no one ever thinks about the home environment. So the thing about these toxins that are found in the environment, a lot of them have a short half-life and they, they come out through the urine, but also a lot of them build up in our systems. And that's a problem, right? Because when you look at, when people talk about, and you might've heard people say this, they say the dose makes the poison with the chemical. And that's true, but it's true in a vacuum. It's true in a study when you have one 
chemical and you see the dose that makes people sick. The reason why I don't, the reason why there's not a lot of data on this is because you can't really test bioaccumulation, meaning how do all of these toxins in our body, when we're exposed to them over X amount of time, how do they affect our overall health? Um, so environmental health in my book is a top six intervention for health and healing. Um, so it's something that I really wanna bring to the forefront to our communities so we learn a little bit better. Okay, next slide. So today we'll talk about what are environmental toxins, uh, what are some of the common ones that we find and you may have heard of, where to start, how to build resiliency in our body. That's very important for us to understand, right? Because all of us, everyone on this, all 150, uh, 15 participants plus us, we've been exposed to it, we're being exposed to it, but the question is resiliency. And then how does naturopathic medicine help? Okay, so next slide. All right, so environmental toxins are things in the environment that are going to cause distress in our body, right? And uh, it can be, we can be exposed through our skin, we can breathe it in, we can eat it, we can drink it. And it depends, it can be natural like a heavy metal, or it can be synthetic like something called formaldehyde or BPA. And our bodies have beautiful detox mechanisms, right? Well, they're called among threes of detox, routes of detoxification. The liver, which I know is, the, is probably the one, the first one you think of when it comes to detoxification, we, 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 we break down those toxins and then we poop them out. Kidneys, we break them down and we pee it out. So our bodies are well equipped to handle these toxins. We breathe them out with our lungs. They even sweat some out through our skin. But the problem is, is that it's two part. Our bodies, because of the crappy food, crappy lifestyles, oh, so many things that are, are less and less resilient than they were when we were younger. Um, but also there's more and more toxins that are coming out in, in the environment. So it's a two part thing where we need to rebalance that weight. So two terms, xenobiotic is something that comes from the environment and affects our body and environmental toxin. But a carcinogen is a toxin that comes from the environment that can actually lead to cancer. And interestingly enough, there's a lot of these toxins, when you read in the studies, they have a direct link. They are, they are causative for cancer, which is pretty incredible when we think about it because they're allowed in small amounts in let's say rugs or couches or beds, cleaning, cleaning supplies. But what happens when we're exposed to that in short amounts, but over a long time? Okay, next slide. So here are some common toxins and, um, and most, of these are, most of these we've been exposed to. Pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, rodenticides. These are how they keep um, the produce clean and, and abundant and not damaged from, from rodents and insects. But the problem is there's a collateral damage effect to us, uh, particularly in the parts of our body that are very much so vulnerable. Uh, for example, the thyroid or the microbiome, our gut, our gut bacteria. Food coloring and other additives. I know that you've all seen the back of boxes and it says red 40 and blue 32. And uh, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm calling out football numbers, but yeah, it's a uh, yellow one at one and two. All these different types of food coloring do have especially neurological effects in the body. Heavy metals is a very interesting one. Heavy metals are the ones that really bioaccumulate. They bioaccumulate in our fat tissue. Uh, and tissues as a whole, so they can build up in our brain. These are things like arsenic, mercury, cadmium, lead. Volatile organic compounds are another interesting one. These are ones that are really in the home a lot. So let's say a lot, if any of you have ever bought, uh, let's say a mattress or like a mattress topper and you open it up in the box and it, and it, it smells up your whole room and you go, oh, it kind of smells like chemicals. Those are volatile organic compounds. Now, those chemicals, don't go away when the smell goes away. They still off gas over the life of the material for the most part, although the most dramatic off gassing is when you first get it, open it up. Um, so there's, there's many chemicals like this. Formaldehyde is one, benzene, toluene. These are things that really affect us too. Industry chemicals, BPA, PFAS, dioxins. BPA is one that we find in receipts, plastic bottles, children's toys, the lining of tomato, the lining of beans, all those canned linings. And BPA is actually one that is, that's in all of us. And I'll talk a little bit about later, but BPA is one that we know absolutely affects multiple systems in our body. 
And almost every person, at least 93% of people in America have it. PFAS, forever chemicals, these were found actually in a consumer report in water bottles. So the PFAS are uh, industry chemicals that break in, hu in a human body takes minimum uh, about 12 to 22 years to break down. So they stay in our body, they stay in the environment for a very long time. Um, dioxins is another one that we find in the environment. HCAs and PAHs, heterocyclic amines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, those are created when we overcook meat or any animal tissue over a fire. So, you know, when it's charred on a barbecue, you have these chemicals and they, they cause a lot of damage into the body. What else? Mold, one that we don't talk about enough considering that almost half of the homes in America have water damage and mold overgrowth and a quarter of us can't break down mold toxins. So mold is a really interesting one that we need to look for, particularly if you have a loved one or someone in your household, including you, who's sick and no one can put their finger on. We always have to start thinking about mold and medications. There's a lot of toxins in different medications. Um, so that's something to talk to your doctor about, but it's just wanted to bring that to the forefront. Okay, next slide. So where do we start? So remember I mentioned the resiliency part. We have to start building up our bodies first and foremost. I'll talk a little bit about that. But a lot of that leads to lifestyle. The very things that can really deplete our body of resiliency come in our lifestyles, right? So if you're smoking or you're drinking alcohol, those things are going to go the opposite way of building resiliency in your body. But what else? Well, we have to start thinking about the food that we're putting in our body, right? All these processed foods, foods that are not in their whole form are going to have a lot of these chemicals. And then the foods that are in their whole, whole form, we have to start thinking about possibly switching to organic. Uh, so organic is going to be really uh, a good way to go far from perfect for sure, but at least it keeps a standard and us knowing, okay, we're not having synthetic pesticides, synthetic herbicides, synthetic insecticides. Water is an important concept. We drink water all day and a lot of us don't think about, oh, how clean and how pure is the water? We'll just grab a water bottle and go. I mentioned BPA, the plastics, but also getting a really high quality water filter that takes all that crap out anyway and then putting it in a stainless steel or a glass jar. Air quality in the home, this is where we start thinking about air filters, opening up the windows every single day, allowing airflow. Those are things for mold and those volatile organic chemicals in, that, in the home. So when it comes to consumer goods, there's, uh, there's really good resources out there. So things like deodorant, lipstick, makeup, shampoo, soaps, all the things we're putting in our body. Uh, and the and consumer goods and also cleaning supplies, we have the Environmental Working Group. They have a website, uh, I believe it's ewg.org. And uh, e the Skin Deep database would be where you look for your cosmetics, where you look for consumer care products. Uh, and then the Guide to Healthy Cleaning would be the cleaning supplies. And what they do is they rank all of these products. So actually, if I grab, let's say, Mr. Clean, from under a cabinet and then I, I look it up and I go, I wonder if my Mr. Clean is toxic. I'll type in the name and then they'll show a grade and why, and it'll be one to 10, I believe, or I think that it's one to five. And you'll see why, uh, and it'll break it down completely and you'll see what chemicals are in it and what parts of the body they affect. And then you can see which better choices are out there. And that goes for makeup, that goes for soaps, that goes for lotions, it's an amazing website and the, one of the best resources for environmental toxins. Okay, next slide. So I mentioned resiliency. Again, we're all exposed to these toxins um, and, and you don't, this doesn't, and the whole talk is not to just, you know, just throw away everything, but just let's keep awareness. If we have all of these, we can check the environmental working group. If we have all of these uh, chemically laden uh, products in our house, okay, how do we build up our resiliency first and foremost, and then start slowly bringing them out and, and making new choices that are healthier. Okay. So optimizing our our routes of detoxification, the liver, really important. There's so many good foods that feed the liver like beets, ginger, cruciferous vegetables, broccoli sprouts, vitamin C rich foods, the liver loves these. So this is why we start have to, have to start adding different colors of fruits and vegetables to our diet because they're gonna help feed our liver. Digestion, if you're not pooping, then that's an issue, right? Because when you don't, it, when, 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 when you're constipated, it's, it's recirculating many of these toxins in the body. So you have to efficiently be going to, going to the bathroom. And if you're not, this, so this is, the, this is where you can start working with naturopathic or functional doctors to really help you get to the root cause of why. 
kidney, make sure you're hydrating, going to the bathroom, uh, kidney rich foods. Again, that's antioxidant rich foods. We're helping your lungs, glutathione rich foods, vitamin C rich foods, vitamin A rich foods, uh, sweating. Ask yourself, how often are you sweating? Um, if you have access to a sauna, that might be a good way to have a sweat every single day, even if you're not working out, especially in the winter, it might be hard or, or the state of the world where it might be hard to even go to the gym. Uh, finding a way to sweat would be really one of the best things. And again, I mentioned lifestyle, alcohol, tobacco, not moving, right? Moving is a really important part of our detoxification process and eating foods that are plant rich, vit uh, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, all the different colors of the rainbow. And then possibly herbs and nutrients. This is something to talk to your doctor about. They can possibly start prescribing things that'll help align with the detoxification process in your body and help support it. Okay, next slide. So this is what I always tell people. It's impossible to avoid the toxins that we have in our house and we have in our office and we have in our schools. But again, the resiliency part is the most important thing that we have to start doing. That's the way we protect ourselves. So um, as I mentioned, we have resources like the Environmental Working Group. And I, and I hope it just lights up a bulb for everyone. Hey, you know what, let me just, he mentioned Environmental Working Group. Let me grab this lotion out of my, bath, uh, out of my uh, bathroom and put it in there and see, and let's just see. And if it's coming up with a red, uh, a red marker, a red marker, a red marker, then maybe we can start making changes to improve that. Okay, and next slide. So the part that I love about naturopathic medicine, uh, in this field, what I find is that not a lot of people talk about environmental toxins, um, unless you're a toxicologist, maybe an endocrinologist, right? Maybe a food scientist. But uh, in this field, what the, the beautiful part about naturopathic medicine is that we look holistically, but we don't just look at in the body, we look at outside the body. Not only our relationships we have with people in our lives, but really how is the environment affecting us, right? If you're going to work, if you're going home uh, and, and you're going to school and you're getting sick over and over, no one can put their finger on it. This is the part where we like to bridge the gap. And there's a major gap, but it's, we're starting to bridge the gap and seeing the connection. And the holistic connection of the body is the most important thing to do, right? Because we can't just put a microscope or a magnifying glass on your liver and go, oh, it's your liver. Well, what about the rest of the body? What about how your, what are your relationships? Is stress, is it home environment? Really important stuff to think about. And it's, and it's putting a gentle, powerful way to healing. Uh, that's, that's my favorite part of naturopathic medicine. We're not kicking down the door, throwing grenades, but where it's gentle over time healing, working with the body for long-term empowerment. So, and I just love that most people, at least from my side, being in social media are very hungry for this type of medicine, it's, and you can tell, and it's because the paradigm now is a sick care paradigm and we can't keep people sick. We have to start empowering them to keep them healthy. All right. All right, so here's what I'm looking forward to. I will be, I'm working to uh, write a book on environmental toxins and resiliency, both educating the public on wh what the toxins are, where they are, uh, where, how they affect our body, but really the resiliency part is the most important. And, uh, and, and speaking about the pillars of health, right? I, I mentioned a few things about uh, just environmental toxins as a whole, but also the resiliency part is not just, you know, taking away alcohol and smoking and eating healthy, but also getting outside, putting your feet on the ground, waking up with the sun, uh, going to sleep when the sun goes down, right? Breathing, meditation, all that builds the resi resiliency, even if you're home has environmental toxins and you're being exposed. Uh, excited about the podcast, as Joanne mentioned, 1.5 million down, uh, now almost 2 million downloads uh, in, less, in less than two years. And the Swell Score. So the Swell Score is um, a co-founder of a company where you can go and now you can buy supplements uh, where they are vetted by professionals like me. There's, there's uh, scientists on staff, nutritionists on staff, where we all work together to put the best quality of every class, best B vitamins, best magnesium, best liver support. Um, and, and it's protecting people from doing all the research where they get more and more lost and ask more and more questions and also from counterfeit products that you may find on Amazon. All right. And here's my contact info, info at docgonzalez.com. I'd be happy to answer anyone's emails um, if you have any further questions after the Q&A. Uh, the podcast is called Heal Thyself. And that's my Instagram at dr.christian.gonzalez.
Thank you so much, Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, before we go uh, to the upcoming events, I was wondering if you might uh, be willing to share a case where environmental medicine or identification of, of environmental issues made a really big difference? Yeah, 100%. So um, I, when I was practicing last year, um, I saw a lot of mold patients. And there was one young girl who came in who, when she came in, she had really dark spots under her eye. You, she had chronic sinus issues. That's the way she showed up initially, the chronic sinus issues. But then what was interesting to me is that her older teenage brother started telling the parents that he started forgetting things like cognitively, he wasn't there. The short term memory wasn't there. And he just didn't feel as, as sharp, quote unquote, was he was saying as sharp as he usually is. And uh, it was interesting when I go, all right, let's for both of you, let's run this mycotoxin test, which are the mold toxins. And, and let's see, right, because they had a new house. So we run the urine test and it's through the roof, all of the mycotoxins, actually one of the highest I've seen. So then we did the parents, the same thing. So I started, it, that leads you to believe there's something going on in the environment, right? There's, there's an overgrowth of mold somewhere. And what they found was, and, and when we think there's a new home, oh, there can't be mold. It's a brand new home. There's new materials everywhere. We don't think about when they were building the home there was rainfall throughout because they built it in the winter. So there was rainfall and snow. So all the materials were wet and moldy and they built over it, which is interesting to me because that's, that's sort of out of our part of medicine. Like we're not, we're not the, the whole materials management at home isn't us, but it's something to start considering because even if you live in a new home, you could still have water damage behind the baseboards, behind the walls, through the vents. And now these children are breathing it in and both of them are sick. So, uh, they had to get it remediated. We got an air filter. We did a detox program for them or help support the body's detox. And they started getting better. It's interesting when you see how resilient children are, the cognitively they were getting better. The young girl, the dark spots under her eyes were better. Her allergies were better. Her sinuses started feeling better. So, um, and that's no one, she went to an allergist or a pediatrician. I can almost guarantee nine, nine out of 10 people, 10 out of 10 aren't gonna look for that. So that's the power of sort of what we do. We, we kind of like investigators outside of the box. Thank you so much. Uh, so before we go to the Q&A section of today, I uh, just wanted to give a little bit of an update on some upcoming events. So we are uh, next month featuring uh, Dr. Spe Dr. Angela Potter on postpartum depression. And uh, so we'll be talking about another really important topic. And then we will also be hosting a virtual fair. So those of you who are uh, prospective naturopathic students, we'd love to have you uh, come. And this is a great opportunity to meet folks from all of the schools uh, and uh, admissions folks and students and faculty and so on. So I uh, hope to see you at a future event. So that said, Connie, can you go to the next slide, please? Wonderful. Uh, so the first question, Dr. Gonzalez, was what was the name of the book that you were in the process of writing? I don't, I'm, I don't know yet. It, it, ah. might be, it might be called Heal Thyself or Resilience, something with the resiliency word in it. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so a, a very common question, uh, especially as people start to dive into wanting their environments a little bit cleaner, is how do I clean my air? And, uh, you know, without plugging any specific product, uh, can you describe, you know, how somebody goes about finding an appropriate air filter for their spaces or their space? Yeah, you, you can look for a HEPA filter. Uh, any air filter that is a HEPA, HEPA filter technology is going to get rid of a lot of the toxins in the home. There's a big scale between the quality of them. You can get one for $99 at, at uh, Kohl's or you can buy one online that's $500, $600. And the difference is in the amount uh, or the technology in the amount of getting rid of the micro toxins in the air, like uh, formaldehyde or mold. Um, so it just depends. But if, when, when I was in naturopathic school, I had, um, I had a, a cheaper HEPA filter. And now, you know, I live in Los Angeles where the air is really crappy. So I have a little bit more expensive one, but, but that's where we start, HEPA air filters. 
Thank you. Yes, I am also in the greater California area. And with the fires, we actually bought a couple extra ones uh, exactly. to have in all of our bedrooms and so on. So, uh, you know, I think just to add on to that topic of air filters, uh, they rate them based on the number of square feet of air that you're trying to move. Right. So you, you, the first step is knowing how large of a space you're trying to filter for your air and then finding an appropriate sized filter that will move the amount of air you're, wor you're working with. Uh, so the next question, Dr. Gonzalez, is uh, regarding books and resources for people who wanna learn more about this area of medicine. Unfortunately, there's not that many resources out there. Um, Dr. Joel Pizzorno wrote a book um, and it, it, it's an awesome toxin book. It's, it's very dense and scientifically oriented, but it's, it's a great way, to, it's a great reference to say, oh, you know, I heard about, I heard about arsenic. I keep hearing about it and, and there's just a report that came out. Let me reference this book. It's an awesome book to have. Um, the Environmental Working Group, uh, EWG, is a uh, really, really good resources, resource too. You can just check the blogs on there and they have everything. You learn about pesticides. They're, they have some stuff about mold. They have some stuff about uh, you know, what mattresses to buy. But really, to be honest, my podcast, I, that's, what, that's where I talk about what and why. For example, I did a mattress show. I talked about what's found in conventional mattresses uh, and what are the labels we need to look for when we buy a mattress. And then I went over the top three mattresses and some of the ones that maybe we should watch out for. Um, yeah, those are the resources that I would say. I don't know the name of the toxin solution. There you go. Yep. Joe Pizzorno. Just got it. The Google, it's very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, there are a few other questions that are coming in regarding molds. And, uh, you know, either if you see mold, like, you know, it's the winter time, like you said, there's condensation. If you see mold, maybe around your windowsills and, or you suspect mold because you've moved into a new location and you have, you're starting to have symptoms. What are some of the steps that, uh, people should consider taking? Yeah, that's a great question because, um, most 50% uh, of homes are going to be water damaged. That's, that's the estimate right now. Um, I will bring up. What, say, for example, in a shower, what you find, that's, that's mildew, and it's less toxic than what you're going to find, like black mold in the baseboards or behind the walls. Um, or let's say, for example, under your sink, you'll see, you'll see dark spots. That's like the black mold, but not all mold is visible, too. One of the steps that you need to take first and foremost is if you're having generalized symptoms, no doctor can put their finger on it, and they really characterize by cognitive issues or some sinus issues, respiratory issues, then it's worth going to a naturopathic doctor to have a mycotoxin test. Let's see if there's mycotoxins, those mold toxins in your urine. And if there is, that might start leading us to say, okay, well, either at school or at home or at work, there's something going on. Also pay attention to how you feel when you're not home or when you're not in school, see if you improve. Let's say for, if it's if you know, the exposure's in school, what about in winter break or, or summer break, you're, you're much better. Or when you leave home and you're staying at a friend's house or you're on a vacation, you start feeling better. Those are telltale signs to start looking for. Um, the remediation process is can be expensive. Uh, so what I always say is if you do, if they do find mold, unfortunately it's gonna need to be remediated uh, because mold can grow and mold can get worse. Uh, so if there's water damage ever in your home, even if there's a big flood in the bathroom and it, it's everywhere, you got to check for mold after that because mold grows pretty fast and it can make a lot of us pretty sick. Thank you so much. So in addition to hi history and physical examination and so on, uh, what are some of the uh, thoughts that you have in regards to laboratory t diagnostic tests or other, uh, other things that you would be doing to understand, I think you mentioned one briefly, understand what the patient's toxin load is and, and how to identify causative factors? Yeah, for, through the tests, you're saying? Yes, for tests. Yeah, so um, that, so you can, you can do a urine mold test and, and that's sort of the first thing that I look for, but not just in mold, there's other tests out there that can test for those environmental toxins, not all of them, but you can test for BPA, you can test for um, a lot of the pesticides, herbicides, insecticide, you can test for things that are found in the water. Uh, you can test for some of the chemicals that are found in gasoline. 
are they getting into your body, right? That's a question. And are you metabolizing them? A lot of the time, these tests, we can see if they're really, really high across the board for a lot of them, that might, that might sort of lead us to start believing, okay, maybe there's issues with detoxification in the body. So how do we build a detoxification process? And, and yeah, we can look, we can look at how your liver's functioning, how your kidney kidneys functioning, but also uh, clinically asking about lifestyle, asking about how are they optimizing their detoxification process? So the resiliency part, um, and again, yeah, like you, you mentioned, poor drainage, right? Are they, are, how's their lymphatic system moving? Is it, are they working out? Are they moving? Um, and how do we support that? So yeah, that, that, that's sort of the way it's, it, there's no, I, there's no like one panel where you come in and say, oh, well, you know, you're toxic, you're not toxic. It, it, it wouldn't work that way. But what we can do is have an idea about what your exposures are, where they're found, let's say the one chemical, where they're found. I mean, let's say I had, I had this patient once through the roof, this chemical that uh, is in the dry cleaning process. And then uh, I asked her, do you dry clean your clothes? She goes, no, but my husband does all the time. All his clothes are almost dry clean. Very few are, are washed, underwear and socks maybe. And it's interesting because there you go. That's her exposure, right? And, and we know that that can lead to breast cancer. So for me, I'm, I go, okay, well, why don't we just either find a non-toxic cleaner around you or start making a change? Good, thank you. Uh, can you speak a little bit about, uh, I know you mentioned the uh, you know, grilling and so on, but can you talk a bit about, you know, if you are trying to fit your home with uh, less toxic types of cooking products, can you speak a little bit about pans and different surfaces and silverware and things that you should be considering in your cooking supplies? Yeah, uh, for sure. There's, um, well, if you're cooking on a Teflon pan, um, that you, you really got to consider getting rid of it. Um, because when it comes to, and those are the non-stick ones, right? The, uh, the technology that they use for non-stick, unfortunately leaches these chemicals. And if you have a bird, and you have Teflon, don't put the bird near the Teflon because those fumes can kill the bird instantly. Um, but yeah, we eat that and they put it, we put it in our body, it's interesting. But um, so Teflon nonstick, if you have one of those pans, it might be good to then move to a different type of pan. Now there's different types of pans and they work differently uh, as far as toxic, but some, some of the best ones out there are the, the cast iron. Although if you have issues with iron yourself, too much iron in your body, you might not wanna get this one. Stainless steel, possibly there's, there's a, a big spectrum. It would have to be high quality stainless steel that doesn't leach nickel. And uh, there's, there's ceramic ones, which are the ones that I have, but they're more delicate. So you can't heat them up too, too much, or you can't put them in the refrigerator for too, too long. Um, it, it just doesn't like temperature changes. The one that I use does not leach chemicals. They test for that, um, which is really important. Silverware, um, I, I would just go with stainless steel. Plates, now, the thing with plates is, especially if they're glazed or colored or they have all these patterns, unfortunately, that's where heavy metals come in and you may be exposed to things like lead or cadmium. So um, what I have is, is just non-toxic ceramic plates that don't leach, no paint or anything on it or designs. And uh, that's, that's, that's sort of the way that I take care of the kitchen. Those are just major things that, you know, we have to think about, we could, it's funny, my air, the air filter that I have every single time I cook will start going off, right? Because we're activating heat, we're moving those fumes, right? Um, and if we have a Teflon pan and it's, and it's, it's getting really hot and fuming that the air filter would go crazy. So you have to think about if you're breathing that in, what that's doing to your body too. Thank you. On the topic of the kitchen, uh, there are a number of questions about water, uh, water filtration, water bottles, uh, you know, best types of water filters to consider either for your home, your shower, uh, or just general drinking water, if you can speak a bit about that. Yeah. Um, so if you're drinking from uh, like water bottles, if you're buying like a, a plastic water bottle pack, I think now would be a really good time to consider changing to buying a stainless steel water bottle or a glass water bottle. I have a glass one and filling it up with filtered water. So when it comes to filtered water, there's um, a few good options. And, and there's, again, like, like the air filters, there's a big spectrum in price point, but um, there's a carbon filters and there's high quality carbon filters that really get rid of a lot. You wanna think about 
getting rid of all of those chemicals, the pesticides in there, the uh, the heavy metals in there, and medications. There's everything. The, our water, and I did a whole show on what's in our water. Is it, I was shocked about what what's found in our water, where it comes from, and how it affects our body. So I think water is the first step to detoxifying our home. Um, and then there's the reverse osmosis ones. The ones under the sink, under the sink are interesting. Uh, reverse osmosis would be a gold standard to pur purifying your water. But the thing is the one under the sink can build up on, in the last step of the osmosis process, the filtration process, the, it can build up some bacteria. So I actually prefer a over-the-counter reverse osmosis um, system where they have some of those, uh, some companies. That those those are my favorite for water, but really it's just if we're if we're drinking from water bottles, how can we start moving away from them? There are um, not only for just BPA, but there's also those PFAS, those forever chemicals that say in the body. I mentioned that, and the Consumer Report found PFAS in high levels in some of the carbonated waters that are really really popular. So um, and and yeah, we can that 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 was on my water show. I just did it actually recently, um, a water show on on what water bottles and PFAS to look out for. So you can check that out too. Thank you so much. Uh, so can you speak to, we've got lots of questions we're going through here. Uh, let's see, uh, in makeup and uh, personal products, what types of toxins should people be looking for? I know you mentioned the environmental working group, but are there specific things that, you know, if you see this on the ingredients list, put it back on the shelf? Yeah, there, there's so many chemicals. I think that, I think we, we have to start thinking about this. It's, if there's, if there's fragrance, if you find just the ambiguous ingredient of fragrance, then you have to start thinking about, can I move away? Especially if it's a synthetic fragrance. Fragrance in itself can be a umbrella term for up to a thousand different chemicals, right? So you, you, you'll see the back of the list and it'll have maybe like 20, but you see the word fragrance, it could be 1,020, right? So it's, it's, it's crazy to me to think that that umbrella term can hide so many other chemicals. Um, so start thinking about that. The, what can be found in things like makeup is heavy metals, um, particularly lead, again, another, uh, another major one. Um, but there's other different hormone disruptors in there too, right? Like BPA. Uh, so for us, I, I think, like I, I, I wouldn't go over all of the list of chemicals, but I think that the move would be to check out the Environmental Working Group and just cross-reference your makeup. Um, there's also the Think Dirty app which you can take a picture of at the supermarket or at the store. I, I don't think it covers all of them, but you can look at the Think Dirty app and it'll show you what chemicals in your particular product are the ones of concern and it'll grade it. Um, I know the Environmental Working Group does do that. So you can look and say, oh, wow, this chemical that's found in this concealer that I use every single day, well, that's a high concern. Whereas this one, it's a low concern and you can weigh it out yourself, but there's the Environmental Working Group certified stamp so that, that across the board is uh, a clean product and, and they reference for that. But yeah, it, when it comes to the bathroom stuff, cosmetics, that's got that, the, Th the Think Dirty app, I mean the Skin Deep app on Environmental Working Group or Skin Deep database is gonna be your best bet. Thank you. So when you're looking at things, uh, foods, so on the topic of looking at a, a label and figuring out what's, what's a cleaner product or what is less likely to have uh, toxins and, and molds and so on, um, you know, things like protein powders and collagens, how do you go about choosing uh, better products? I know you spoke about the uh, network for supplements. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so food, foods is, it is a whole interesting topic because when it comes to uh, the food industry, there's so much, there's so much ambiguity and confusion. So I, you don't know when I was in practice how many times I got people say, "Well, what do I eat?" Because I'm so confused now. Um, I think the rule of thumb always is going to be: Can the majority of your diet be in whole food form? If it's coming in packages uh, and it's lasting for months, then it, then that should be a small percent of our diet, right? So. Uh, and, and particularly if you look at the back and it has a long list of ingredients and think, can you pronounce it? Have you heard these names of ingredients? Are they in the whole form? Can you name them yourself? Or do they sound really scientific? If they sound really scientific, well, it may not have an effect in the body, maybe minimal, but 
you want to stay away when there's a huge list of all these chemicals that you've never heard of, because that as a rule of thumb is going to be really affecting you. Um, so think about whole food forms, all the colors, fruits and vegetables, um, trying to bring in the majority. And, and again, it's different for different people, but I always say for most people, can we involve most of these whole foods, especially plants in different colors in our diet? Um, yeah. And that, and, and, and again, it, like the, the whole food thing and is, is a tough thing, but look, always look to see if you can organic, right? I know the environmental working group does the clean 15 and dirty dozen. There's a lot of controversy behind that in itself too. Um, but it's a good rule of thumb. Like if I buy berries, they're usually organic. They're going to be organic almost hundred percent of the time. If I buy kale, right. If I buy spinach, these leafy greens are going to be organic. But if I buy pineapple, or papaya or avocado, they're not usually organic. So, and, and you notice the pattern of the hard shell on the back versus the, the soft the soft plant matter. Thank you. Uh, so I re there's a couple questions here about laundry and fragrances and so on. I remember as a kid, you know, thinking that that's that smell of yeah. the fragrance of the laundry detergent meant something was clean. And yeah. now I very much know the difference. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, ch choosing different types of laundry detergents and how to, how to make uh, choices that are, uh, you know, both good for the environment as well as good for us? Yeah. So I, uh, there's a big part of my show is to go over all these consumer products. And I did a whole show on laundry talking about what's found in conventional laundry products how they affect our body and better options out there. When it, and, and you're right, Joanne is, is like, that's how I thought it was. If it smelled like lemongrass cotton, then it was clean as it is. And my, you know, my sheets are clean, my, my, my clothes are clean. Unfortunately, those synthetic fragrances are having an endocrine disrupting effect. They can affect your hormones, especially over time. So imagine we wash all our clothes, we're wearing them all day, we breathe that in. We come home, we change, we, we take a shower, we put on our pajamas, we go to bed. Oh, our bed sheets, our pillowcases, our comforter, right? So we're breathing these hormone disruptors all the time. Not only our hormones, they affect our nervous system. They affect our immune system. So many of them can be carcinogenic over time, meaning lead to cancer. And, and it, it's some, in many ways, it sounds interesting. We're talking about laundry detergent and cleaning clothes. How are we talking about cancer? But, but why are we not, right? Because there's a connection and we need to talk about it. So uh, when it comes to laundry detergent, um, I, I, I don't wanna plug any companies, but I speak about the ones that I use and why. Um, they're not fragrant um, or they have natural fragrances, possibly through essential oils, but not chemically synthetic fragrance. Um, and, and to be honest, if you have someone in your family or you are particularly sensitive, and your skin gets, you know, you just notice your skin is very sensitive, your respiratory system, you may get, if you have asthma, these are things, the first interventions, look at your clothes first, look at your laundry detergent and see if you can remove that. So you're not really affecting, or you're reducing the load on your lungs, on your skin, on your body. So, so you're not affected by it. So again, if you're very sensitive, this might be the first move for you. Thank you. Uh, so a question came in regarding, I know we've been talking a lot about what's in the home, but uh, especially now with the pandemic, so, mu so many of us are uh, having way more increased screen time. Can you speak a little bit about the, the role of uh, you know, screens and so on in our overall health? Oh, great question. And, and you know, we didn't have enough time, but I, would have, I could do another environmental toxin is blue light coming from the screens and it's changed over time since I, you know, I was in my teens till now the blue light time is, is a massive difference. So I always think about what can we do to reduce blue light? So blue light in, a, in, in essence is just going to affect our hormones in particular. Um, it'll disrupt our natural hormones. They, it's believed that tw after sunset, for every hour of blue light that you're getting, whether computer, TV, phone screen, it's reducing your melatonin secretion by 20%, which is incredible. Melatonin is not only our sleep hormone, but it's also our regenerative rejuvenating hormone when we're sleeping, right? It cleans out all the junk, reduces inflammation, uh, to, uh, kills all of the dead bugs in our body or removes the dead bugs in our body. It's, it's, it stimulates the immune system. It's everything at night. It is why we heal at night. So. Um, reducing blue time is really important. If you're on your computer every single day, especially at night, this is where we think about blue blockers and, um, you can wear blue blockers. There's different ones. There's a day one that, that lets in a little bit of blue light. So you can see, 
Uh, but then at night, it just completely blocks it. That, I, I do the night one more than I do the day one. I can have them on right now, but I just don't. But the night one, for sure. Every time sun sets, I put on the blue blockers, not only because I'm sensitive to sleep, but also the melatonin statistic was, or the melatonin, uh, the part about reducing melatonin was really important for us to understand too. Yeah, so screen time is really, really important thing to think about. Thank you so much. Uh, gosh, lots of questions coming in. Uh, all right. So in, in speaking to, you know, if you're thinking that maybe there's something going on here, how do you help get this message across to patients and for them to their family members that this is an important area for consideration? Uh, you know, oftentimes what people don't see, they don't really believe mm -hmm. uh, is harmful. And, uh, you know, these lifestyle uh, interventions, you know, people may have been cooking you know, with Teflon forever and they say, oh, I've been cooking with it forever. It's, you know, this isn't a problem for me. It's, you know, I'd, I'd be dead if it was really bad. And people tend to minimize that. But I know you talked about overall total load. Um, can you maybe talk a bit about how you help people understand this is an issue? Yeah, I, I, cause I'm such a visual person and all throughout school, I needed to draw pictures for me to understand. I do the same. Um, so if I'm with someone and back when I was really practicing, I had a whiteboard behind my, my um, chair and I would draw just like sort of the rain barrel effect. I draw a big cup. Right. And I tell them like, we are all have genetically this different size cup and, uh, yours, mine can be a shot glass. Yours can be a mason jar, a giant mason jar, but the cup is continuously filling up with different things. Uh, toxins in our food, the air we breathe, uh, to, to different diseases, infections, just different things in our body, they're filling it up. But when it overflows, this is where we manifest different diseases. Now, genetically, I might have joint issues where you might have gut issues where your sister may have neurological issues, but we manifest disease. What I tell people is because the different size of the cups exist, which is dictated by stress. I always tell people how stressed you are. This determines really the size of the cup and also genetics, but we can dump that cup out when we start building one resiliency and taking care of our environment. Uh, so I, I think the visual is really helpful. Even if we think about like a little micro dropper and I'm putting in a drop every single day, you don't feel it. You go, you, you don't notice a difference in the level of the, the cup filling up, but over time it does. And, and I think for people to understand, it's, it, it builds up over time, it's insidious, we don't feel it. Um, a lot of us go, well, if I don't feel it, why do I bother? And then we do something when we do feel it. And I think that we have to start empowering people to be more proactive and preventative first. So the visual for me was really helpful for people to understand, um, but it's just a matter of the, the, like putting an emphasis on proaction right? Now's the time to do it. If your mom had breast cancer or your dad had prostate cancer, now's the time to make sure that we're not having our hormones disrupted by the stuff, not only already the stuff that we're exposed to like stress, uh, but also like the chemicals in our house, the chemicals in our schools, the chemicals in our makeup. These are known hormone disruptors. How do we start making the intervention now, right? So people can be empowered in the future. Um, I, again, jo Joanne, that's a good question because it's hard to get people moving. But I think that if we put it in a way where they're not overwhelmed, but more empowered, go, you know what? My mom did have breast cancer. I want to take care of my breast when I'm older or now. Now's the time to make the change. And, um, and I could do small things, just small things, small changes around the house. Then we can be empowered. Thank you. We've had a number of prospective students, future students asking, you know, A, how did you get into this? And if I am interested in, you know, integrative oncology or more environmental medicine, uh, what are things that I can do now as I'm, you know, looking into this career uh, as a student? Mm -hmm. So uh, you can look at uh, onc a &P, the Oncology Association of Naturopathic Physicians. Um, this association is sort of like, that's my people, right? We do integrative oncology. We, there's blogs, uh, where to find someone that maybe in your town you can shadow and learn more about it. Um, again, environmental medicine part is hard. There's different organizations. Um, but I think that, I think that 
I can't, when it comes to resource, all I can do is really give the book resource, environmental working group and my podcast. I personally would be happy to um, answer any emails from people coming uh, and emailing from this and emailing me about any environmental medicine questions. And um, I can see if I can direct you to more resources. But at this point, there's, there's no giant national organization that I, that I look to that, um, that does the work that I think environmental working group does. Thank you so much. Uh, so here's a really good question. Uh, if you could do three things or recommend three things for someone to start it on a healthier lifestyle, what would you recommend? Okay. Uh, water filter, first and foremost. And uh, again, listen to my water show. It was the first part. There was two parts, water show episode, episode one, the first uh, water show. And I go over all the water filters, the popular ones. Uh, and from a, a different price points too for affordability. And I talk about my favorite ones and you guys can make your decision. After you listen to that, you can research it and see which one aligns with you more. Um, so water filter is gonna be number one. Air filter, I also did a whole show on all the air filters. One of my first shows I ever did. And um, so now we're, we're talking about, we've cleaned your water, we've cleaned your air. And um, I think the next move would be probably just moving into, it would be moving into more plants and looking to just change the things that need to be organic, right? Like the leafy greens, the berries, the spinach, all of these foods that are really delicate and, and just seeing, okay, let me just add in more organic or even better, go into the farmer's market, getting in touch with your farmer and talking to them about their organic practices and supporting them would be a really nice move too. And you'll get more, more, for your, more bang for your buck. So, so now we've covered the food, I, and the, the oral, the water, the food, and then the air. Um, and I think after you have you start building your resiliency like that, then you could start moving to like, oh, okay, there's my shampoo, there's my makeup, um, there's my my body lotion, my face wash. Then that would be the next thing. But really, every single day you're drinking water, but every single day you're not putting on, you know, exfoliator. Thank you. Uh, so lastly, uh, talking about, uh, you know, things that people can do, obviously the day-to-day -day stuff, the making sure that your daily life is, uh, not filling up that cup more than you can empty the cup out. Uh, but on that topic, I know that around the first of the year, people think about cleanses and detoxification. Can you speak a little bit about, uh, the role of detox cleansing, uh, you know, maybe intermittent fasting, things of that sort in, uh, in detox. I know you mentioned sweating briefly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, one of my very, uh, recent shows was on supporting the skin, but I also talked about, uh, detoxification as a whole right after. So covered, I did a whole detox show. Are the detox kits out there real? Should you buy a $300 detox kit? So really what I spoke about in summary on the show is, is optimizing these organs of detox. And I went over every single one, liver, kidney, lungs, lymphatic system, um, your skin, and how to support them. There's different foods out there that you can support each organ with, each tissue with. There's different uh, modalities, even breath work, sauna. These are things that really support, remember it's first supporting those among threes, those organs of detoxification and then after that, we go, all right, you know, like, let me talk to my doctor. Should I start this supplement that supports detox? Maybe, maybe not. But always it's you first building that resiliency for yourself um, and taking the things out that, that really cause a forest fire in your body, right? The alcohol, the smoking, the processed foods, the stress. Those are all things that do the opposite of helping your body detox. So can we remove those and how? Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I think there there are a number of other questions about EMFs and computers and blue blockers and you know even uh, you know putting tech into night shift mode. Uh, is there anything specifically? You know, I know some some folks will say you know take a tech break uh, for an hour a day. You know, have one hour you know one day free of tech a week yeah. if you can uh what what types of things do you think you know obviously this this world especially now with coronavirus and so many things having moved online it's even harder uh but what are your recommendations there yeah so um it's funny because there's there i do i feel like i do a show for everything i did a show called Do dopamine detox 
for uh, talking about how screens affect us and talking about how EMFs affect us. I didn't go into super detail about EMFs, but enough where we know that, especially th th there was a study in children, children using any blue device, whether it's a phone or an iPad over seven hours had changes in their brain, the way their brain was structured, which is interesting uh, because what's it doing to us when we're on it for more than seven hours? A lot of people are on it for more than seven hours for screen time or think about being on the computer all day, then coming home and using your phone. So some of the major recommendations I make is first and foremost, um, you can adjust. There's different apps on the computer. There's one that I use called Flux, F-L-U-X. And that will change the brightness and it'll change, uh, it'll change the hue such that it's not affecting your eyes. The same thing, um, I wish I had my phone around me, but my phone, my phone, oh, here it is. So you can do this on your phone actually at night, you can put it in red mode like that, which is interesting. You can, so all you have to do is Google uh, red tint on the phone and see now it's back to this and now it's back to this. You can Google red tint on your phone and do the shortcut with three clicks on the side. And so come, let's say I don't have my blue blockers or so for some folks who are like, listen, blue blockers are, blue blockers are kind of expensive because they're not that many good brands, but I talk about the best ones. Um, you can do this with your phone or your computer through the Flux app. And then you're, you're already reducing by almost, almost 80, 90% the blue light that's coming on. Some of them 100% with the blue blockers. Really important. I, when it comes to EMFs, this is what I tell people. Like, it, it, this is one of those things that are, that are obscure that we don't necessarily feel or we can't put our finger to it all the time. Because there's, a, it, there, there's not enough data right now for me to say, EMFs do this, this, and this. We know some things that it, that, that it does in the body. And we know in cells how it affects cells. And we know in children's brains how it can affect their, their brains. But what I say is, if you're off, if, your brain, if you're not feeling good, if you're suffering from symptoms that you don't know, then reduce that blue, blue, blue light in your, in your screens and also turn off your Wi-Fi at night. Just turn it off. Just unplug it. Every night I unplug it. I don't need it. And, and see if there's an improvement in your sleep, see if there's an improvement in your energy, see if there's an improvement in your symptoms. It's just something to think about, right? It would be better to be proactive than wait for a study that says EMFs do this, this, and this. Right now, um, right now that, that's, that, that's a responsibility that we can do that we can take. And then dopamine detoxes, like ask yourself, how often are you on your phone? Do you need to be, I don't turn, I don't turn my phone on till about 10, 11 AM every morning. Um, cause I take the morning to myself. It's so important for me to not be on those phone, my phone for three hours. So it's an airplane mode. When I sleep, it's an airplane mode. When I wake up for three hours, then I turn it on. And that for our mental health is so, 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 so important. It's, it's the mental, emotional health is connected to our physical. So part of the whole detox protocol is also this whole mental, emotional stress that we have, right? The, the reward that we get from the dopamine that we, when we get a like or something like that, just, just thinking about how can we not let that control it and let's, let's be dictators, let's control it ourselves. So those are some of the things that I, I tell folks to use to reduce that blue screen time, but also reducing that dopamine connection to the phone. Well, Dr. Gonzalez, we are just about out of time here. I am so very thankful for uh, this talk today. I know that we had a lot of really good question and dialogue, uh, and I very much appreciate you taking some time and speaking with our audience today. Uh, thank you again on behalf of AMC, and I know our audience also is, is thankful for your time here. Um, so with that, we're going to conclude today's uh, webinar and uh, hope that you can join us at a future event. Uh, again, Dr. Gonzalez, thank you for coming today. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you everyone for showing up and I really hope that this was helpful. Yeah, I appreciate it. Take care. Okay.